Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for joining. We're so glad you're here. Uh, we're going to get started in the next few minutes while we uh, and while we wait for everyone to join, uh, please get settled in. And if you could, uh, please take the poll question that you see on the screen now. Uh, this poll question, along with a few others, will be available during the entire event. And um, so here we see if, let's see, sorry about that. All right, here we see, um, we're curious to find out in what area of, of your hiring process are you trying to improve efficiency? So where are you seeing the most inefficiency in your hiring? Looks pretty even between onboarding, recruiting, interviewing and screening. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're going to get started as more people file in. Um, we encourage you to take the poll question on the screen right now if you haven't already done so. Uh, this poll and all other questions around uh, team size and resource capacity will help us better understand who's in the room so we can um, best help you with all of your hiring initiatives. So jump over to the side panel uh, to find those questions. Cool. All right, resourcing, what is the size of your HRTA team? Looks like 80% of you have said it's less than 10 or one to 10. And again, for folks uh, just coming in to the room, if you wanna make your way over to the side panel, there's a poll section where you can go ahead and answer some of these questions. All right, why don't we go ahead and uh, move on. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank all of the partners uh, who put today's webinar together, Clear Company, Codility, and of course, Checker. Uh, thank you for helping co-host this webinar and a big thank you to our speaker speakers here today uh, for sharing their time with us. So thanks again for all the time and energy uh, you put into this event. So today we're gonna have a great discussion on embracing automation for more efficient hiring. Uh, a couple of quick notes before we start. If you have trouble with audio or video, uh, please reach out through the help chat on the right side panel. Um, everyone in the muting is muted, uh, but we encourage you to be active in the discussion through chat and let us know how you're tackling uh, some of the challenges we're discussing here today. And third, uh, we love questions, so please send any questions you have for the panelists in our Q&A slide panel at any time. Uh, you can also upvote questions in the Q&A section if you'd really like to hear an answer to a specific question. Um, so we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the event. Um, and at the end of the session, you will see an SHRM uh, credit come through in the chat. So make sure to write down that code if you want to receive credit for today's session. And finally, um, we'll be sending out the recording to the email address uh, that you registered with. And as always, a few days post event, you'll be able to find this content on demand on the Checker website. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Okay, let's start uh, with some introductions. We have an amazing group of panelists today. Um, so just tell us who you are, a bit about your organization and your favorite part about what you do. So I'll kick us off. My name is Sherry. I'm on the product marketing team at Checker. My favorite part about what I do is meeting customers to understand their stories and bringing people together to solve problems. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Allison. Hi, I'm Allie Smith, I, or Allison. Um, I am the director of talent at STG, a private equity firm focused on mid-market software investing. And the favorite part about what I do is just when I collaborate with executive teams and I've been a part of their hiring process and 
they've had a win recently, um, whether that's they've recruited for their team or they've hit a KPI or the business has turned a corner, whatever the win may be, small or, or big. Um, that's just, I, I love hearing those stories. Awesome. Uh, Brian? Yeah, hi, I am Brian Abraham. I am Director of Talent Acquisition at Clear Company. Clear Company is a full platform talent management system. So we do, we have a recruiting uh, tool, we have an onboarding tool, goals and performance tools, et cetera. Uh, I think for me, I mean, I love, obviously, I think like all of us, I think I love being part of matching people to roles where they thrive. Maybe you get lucky enough to match someone to their, their dream job. But I think on top of that, it's kind of unique. I, what I love about this role is being, I'm sort of at that intersection of being responsible for hiring the folks into our company, but also being able to get involved in product dis uh, discussions, drive actually some product decisions in our talent uh, platform. Uh, and maybe also help other companies and other recruiting yeah. professionals with more of that, um, you know, speed things up and also more accurate hiring. So uh, it's a unique role. That's what I love about it. Great. Uh, and Tisha? Hi, everyone. I'm Antisha Wally. I go by Tisha. Um, I'm the president and lead consultant at Make the Change um, LLC. Make the Change is a human resources um consulting firm. Uh, we're based out of the Austin, Texas area. And one of the things that um, I do like, and I'll speak to recruiting since that's kind of what this is about, is being able to help recent HR graduates who may not have the experience that Okay. Sounds like we might have some connection issues. Um, in the meantime, while we figure that out, why don't we go ahead and pass it off to, to Jeremy? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Jeremy Schmidt. I'm the Senior Director of Global Talent uh, at Codility. And the favorite part about what I do is, is a little bit of what Brian touched on, is when you align that perfect person into their dream job and then just sit back and, and watch them thrive and, and be successful. I think that's really what kept me in this game, the struggle uh, for the last 20 plus years. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. So why don't we go ahead and jump into our panel discussion? So the first question, um, HR leaders spend an average of 40% of their time on administrative manual HR tasks. So how do you go about identifying those manual tasks that slow down and get in the way of hiring efficacy? And in your opinion, uh, what areas should we actually be focused on slowing down? Allison, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I think um, it, that stat's interesting. I would love to dive into all, all, of, all of that and kind of what, what specifically those areas are. I think, you know, a bit of pattern recognition on, you know, what components are actually hard um, and, and just drilling down and in, into the data of how long is a candidate staying in a certain you know, part of the funnel and really understanding if your target strategy is really aligned with the candidates that you, that you actually have. And I think you know, from there, you can identify the inefficiencies um, in the numbers. And, and I've always mapped the, the number of candidates on an active open rack or, or search, whether it's executive level or um, even you know, entry level. If you have over 400 people that you're contacting and looking at, okay, great, but what's the percentage of people you're actually engaging with? And then going from there, maybe it's the messaging of the mark, you know, of the of the kind of marketing of the role. But I think you know you can you can really see um, areas by the numbers and, and, and looking from there. So I'll, I'll start, I can, I can go down, but I'll start there and, and kind of pass it off. Great. Brian? Yeah. So, I mean, similarly, I think we first, what we did to sort of identify um, areas for improvement is first kind of look at our time to fill um, and um, well, I should say time to hire kind of time to hire for, you know, how long our process is taking from sort of initial contact through uh, an offer Right. And then working backward from there, where what's the benchmark for that? Right. So we looked at I think we looked at some Sherm data in our industry. It was taking other companies about 44 days 
Uh, we have that down now to half of that. We're at about around 22 days. So we're always kind of looking at the big picture first, but I think that it is work backwards and have the ability we have, we do have pipeline analytics uh, built into our platform, right? So we can see the amount of time that people are spending at each stage. One of the biggest things we can talk about a little bit, I think we're going to talk a little bit later on, but we did identify a couple of major gaps that we just were going through sort of status quo and thought, hey, you know, we, that's, that's normal. We've always done it that way. Let's keep doing it that way. But then I saw sort of a, a major gap in the numbers of how long it was taking just after we did an initial outreach message to candidates and how long it was taking us to actually get them, um, you know, into that first screen. And so those are where you can start to identify some bottlenecks. Don't, I, don't, I would say don't make assumptions um, that certain steps should remain. I say, I say dissect everything look at everything and rethink everything. Uh, I would say for steps to slow down, um, I, I say, you know, make, be willing to make your process more efficient, but not so efficient that you're, you know, abandoning uh, ability to effectively evaluate quality or get quality into the process. And so um, I think another kind of key measurement there is quality of hire. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that we do is we cross reference our uh, interviewing scores with our uh, performance scores. We scale on the same score system, right? So we can see and then uh, correlate and sort of compare those scores and see how closely our interview scores are to our performance scores. And so we're constantly looking at that. And if we're off, we our platform also evaluates even down, it's sort of a rate the rater, right? We can even down to looking at how the interviewers are interviewing, how close they are consistently to like sort of the, the number of the performance goals and everything else. And sort of that might identify areas where you might need to train, um, you know, one of your, your managers or somebody who's on the interview team, et cetera. So there's a lot of um, uh, analytics that can come out of that or, or areas for improvement out of that. But I would say those are definitely hone in on sort of the, the pipeline analytics, your time to hire uh, and quality uh, of hire. Great. Um, and Tisha? Love to get to love to get your thoughts as well. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, why don't we pass it off uh, to Jeremy and we'll figure out okay. those connection issues. I'll dive in. So. Um... One of my old CEOs used to always say, uh, how do you know if you're winning if you're not keeping score? And so when we look at inefficiencies in the process, it does start uh, you know, with the data. So having the ability to look at true pipeline analytics, time and stage, and identify where those efficiency are, uh, it's, it's really key to be able to make any type of actionable insight or, or decisions around that. Uh, we've actually integrated GEM uh, with Greenhouse. Uh, Greenhouse is our ATS, and that has helped us tremendously in identifying a lot of those gaps. Um, also, I'd like to give a, a quick shameless plug to our, our product here at Codility, because this is exactly what our tool does um, when you're looking at the technical hiring process. So if you are hiring engineers at scale, you know the most difficult part is assessing their technical skills quickly and efficiently, uh, but that's exactly where Codility comes into play. So we're going to help you remove the bias through that process, create that automation, integrate with your ATS so that you can provide stronger, more technically sound candidates faster um, by really understanding their, their technical aptitude at the top of their funnel. Um, one area that we've really tried to slow down uh, is the feedback stage with candidates. And we really, really do our best to live our values. And one of those is we're real and we're human. And we want to be able to provide live feedbacks to candidates with honesty and transparency. And at times that can be cumbersome, especially when you're hiring a global market to try to set up live one-on-one -on -one calls. Uh, but I really think if you lead with that people first approach, it does go a long way with your employer brand. Uh, and candidates really appreciate that the fact that you're, you're, you're gonna take the time to jump on with them live. Uh, and you know, treat others the, the way that you like to be treated. So I think it's a, a big step in our process and, and something that, that we want to continue to do. Great. Those are good uh, words of wisdom there. 
uh, treat others the way you'd like to be treated. Okay, moving on. Uh, there are many areas of the hiring process that uh, could be automated to reduce errors. So can you share some insight on where you've automated parts of your process? And are there any places you're still working on automating? Tisha is back. Why don't we uh, kick, it, kick it off to you? Hopefully you can hear me now. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, all right. So, yeah. Um, so sending automatic notifications, um, scheduling emails, um, making sure that the candidates are able to get that information as quickly as possible so that you don't necessarily have to remember to do it. Um, those are some of the areas for me where we try to reduce er uh, errors. Also, um, pre-written assessments where you don't have to at each um, job posting and each interview have to figure out what, what questions are you going to ask. Having those be pre-written and then sending those to candidates. I've also answered across different companies. Um, I feel like I'm always trying to figure out ways where, you know, we can Okay. Um, thanks, Tisha. Uh, Jeremy, we'd love to get your thoughts as well. Yeah, one area where we've added a lot of automation that's really expedited our process is, is around the scheduling piece. And if you aren't lucky enough to have a team of extremely talented recruiting coordinators to help facilitate that process, it's definitely one area that I would look into uh, to see what type of automation you can create. So again, we use Greenhouse as our ATS. So it has some new functionality to where you can integrate uh, for free with Calendly so that you can send candidates a link to your calendar and then they can add time directly. This definitely saves that back and forth of actually trying to get a human to, to answer their cell phone, which these days is, is very, very challenging. Um, we've also built templates in Greenhouse around uh, filling out scorecards, setting SLAs with our hiring managers so they, they understand how quickly they have to turn those around to keep the process moving. And I think another huge area for, for automation comes with, with data and reporting. And like I mentioned before, we use GEM for our data visualization piece out of Greenhouse. And GEM has some awesome capabilities where you can integrate that directly with Slack. And so what we've done is we've created Slack channels for each of our roles, and then we can automate uh, the delivery of pipeline reports. So every Friday morning, a uh, report goes out to each of our hiring managers so they can understand exactly what's going on with their roles, uh, candidates in stage, um, uh, how or when we anticipate the role being filled based on pipeline activity and historical uh, data pipeline uh, analytics that we have from similar roles you know, in the past. So if you want happy hiring managers, um, I would say nothing beats the proactive delivery of data uh, without them actually having to ask what's going on with my rec. So I highly recommend that. Great. Allison? Yeah, so this is a passion topic for me, um, just around the talent acquisition portion of, of HR in general. And I think no matter, again, kind of what, what level you're hiring for, and the volume of roles that you are hiring for, there are portions that you can definitely automate. That's more of the science of, of acquisition. Uh, it's why Hunt Club was started, if anyone's familiar with that business and, and why I joined when they were a team of under 10. And, and it was really cutting through the first two weeks of a search process and knowing that you often get to a end candidate through referral or a recommendation and great people know great people. And so if you can just go ahead and automate the back channel process and front load that into the first 10 days of launching your search, we all know that a search is really one during that launch phase. And it, as long as the target strategy, the role description, and, and to Jeremy's point, you're really streamlined in identifying what is needed for the role and matching that to the experience of a person. And then in making that just wrapped around with an insurance policy of a back channel, 
that you can automate that in the, in the front. So when you're having an interviewing process, make sure every interviewer during the, the slate knows what they're diving into, give them a specific area. So every time that same person is asking the questions and they're assessing that area the same way. So it's a bit more unified. And then through that, I know, I think we'll touch on this a little bit later, you're really collecting the feedback. So you're, if you come across that candidate again, or your team member does, or whomever on you know, the team, a hiring manager, you have that data, you, you have that understanding of how the candidate performed in the process. Um, or if a candidate you know, decides to not continue in a process, you have maybe timing, compensation, location information. Um, so I really think about it in, in a couple of different buckets. It's a search execution piece. What can you automate to still maintain the, the art of the candidate experience? And then on your team, you know, what, what can you look at and what can you identify and automate to, to reduce errors? And a lot of it's the reporting, you know, to, to Jeremy's point. Um, but also with when I was at True with Thrive as an ETS, there was a login for clients to see with full transparency, exactly where the search stood, where candidates were in a process. It was a system we as partners used, uh, the entire true firm used. And so in terms of errors, there's just an intrinsic trust that's built on the front end as well, if you are a search partner. But if you're an HR leader, you know, really utilize that, that ATS as your vehicle for communication with your hiring managers. Um, and I think, I think that that helps for the execution piece, um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I'll put a pin in it. <laughs> um, I would say, I would say too, with just the last thing with the engagement, with the candidate engagement, so you have the execution and then you kind of have the marketing. Um, we have a portfolio company, Symphony Talent, that does help with that full life cycle to make sure it's unified. So I would say, just make sure that that process, if your HR team is doing a lot of the outreach um, for candidate engagement, you can automate that really simply. Thanks, Allison. Uh, Brian, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I definitely would um, second uh, what uh, Jeremy talked about a little bit there on Calendly. So when I was the example I was giving earlier, uh, where we identified this major gap, it was just the first contact reach out maybe to passive candidates um, right, to get them to schedule time with us. And sometimes we'd be like, oh, I'm available here. Oh, okay, well, I'm available here. Well, let's set some time up. They got to meet a day later. I mean, sometimes it's literally a week and a week is an eternity, uh, especially in this market, right? So uh, we actually got that down to like one to two days um, to schedule those. And that was by implementation of a Calendly link. So I think if people are not using that yet, like I definitely say get on board with that because you're eliminating all that back and forth. You're saving a big, big chunk of time and similarly, too, our platform has the ability it's to incorporate Calendly links into our outreach messages. We have templating capabilities, so you can template it, you know, automate all of those processes. That's key. Um, so, so a lot of it, there's a couple other areas, I would say, for interviewing is a big, a big area that takes up so much of our time. We, something we developed, and I was also involved in, and look for this in your platforms, too, is like a multi, we have a, what we call a multi-interviewer scheduling tool. And so what it allows us to do is to schedule all of the pertinent details of one interview in like a single click, essentially, like we, we can build what goes out. It's, it's also templated, but we build what goes out to the candidate because a lot of times the information going to the candidate is different than the information that's going out to uh, the interview team, right? They need different things in there. Uh, and so rather than us have to manage and send out these two different invites, and also we're, we send scorecards. Our scorecards go onto the manager's um, calendar and it has everything the manager needs. They can show up potentially sometimes late. This happens, right? They roll in a minute late. Where's the resume? Where's the, right? Awesome. And so where's the, what, in, what questions do I ask? Like our, our, um, uh, our tool allows this automatic send of a scorecard that has their whole resume, all the evaluation, all based on the competencies for the role and sample questions to ask for the competencies for that role all in one spot. And so that gets sent out as well. We're sending all of that information in one, in one single click of a button. So that is really, uh, and myself and our principal recruiter are also involved in the design of that because we're like, this is this would be our ideal world, and we created it, and so it's great. Um, 
Uh, and so I think those are, that's really important. Um, we'll talk a little bit more to, I think uh, later about, you know, that step of like doing the evaluations and how critical that is. But um, I would say um, one of the last things I would point to too, is like, we are able to take notes in real time on our platform, right? So we have this note capability. So I can have their, their resume up. I'm taking notes during my screen, but I can tag my managers in, the, in those notes. So sometimes while I'm on a call, they're getting notifications like, hey, this person's looking for this. Is it going to work? They have this, this skill set. Will that work? Sometimes that allows us to be decision immediately. I sometimes will wrap my call and actually already have my hiring manager's screen scheduled before my call is over. Uh, that's something I would say really work in. If you can work that into the end of your screens, rather than try and get on a rapport with your managers where they have a comfort level of, hey, uh, maybe you need to use some data to, to say, hey, I've been 95% accurate on moving to the next screen. Trust me, let me move that forward on my, make the call on that. And now you're scheduling that second interview within 24, 48 hours rather than another week. Oh, hey, manager, does this look good? You know, three days later, oh, sorry, I was out doing this. Yes, that looks great, right? Now you're you losing another week of time, right? So I think pay close attention to that. Uh, on a macro level, I'll wrap with this. Like one of the biggest tools we're working on now on the analytics front is workforce planning. And this is going to combine, this is some data, some information I've never seen, but it's sort of combining historical um, HR data, such as like how, how long it takes for teams to ramp and be effectively ramped, what's your turnover rates granularly within your company, but also externally in the market compared to financial modeling, in, you know, models that you typically would see in your CFO office, right? To say, well, if like, you know, you have uh, your 13 headcount, you're at 13 headcount, but you're expected to lose six people this year and it takes six months to ramp. So if you don't start hiring now, it's going to cost you $1.3 million, right? So that's a whole different conversation and putting you in a much more proactive spot. And so those are, I think that is where um, talent management is headed. We've, the holy grail, in my opinion, is being proactive, being in a proactive spot. There's so many teams that end up reactive and always going, oh, we need somebody yesterday because we didn't see this coming. And now H, you know, recruiting HR's back is against the wall and you're being blamed for all the money that's being lost when you had, really had nothing to do with it. So, um, so yeah, I think that's where things are headed and I'll wrap there uh, with, with that question. Great, thanks so much. And I saw someone in the chat, Madeline Cleveland had mentioned also, like many of you um, using a system that helped with scheduling links. So she uses Breezy um, to help send auto emails as well. Okay, great. Um, why don't we shift over to DEI? Um, how can we use automation to improve DEI efforts and reach company goals? Allison, let's start with you. I think it's it's just, it, it, so DE and I overall, it's, I'll take a step back. If you have a strategy set, then plugging in the numbers is fairly seamless. It's getting to that point where you've identified exactly what you're measuring. So that I think is the really pivotal point of setting a DE and I strategy. It's it is measuring, it is understanding the numbers, but it's also tying that to what matters for the business and what DEI metric are really going to push the needle for the business's success. And from there, I think once you identify what that is, is it for private equity specifically, I'll use the example, it's diversity of gender, it's diversity of race, it's diversity of age. There's a lot of metrics that go in to, I think, measuring private equity that are fairly basic and fun fundamental, but it's still just a starting point for where private equity is on that DEI journey. Some businesses may be down to looking at specific functional attrition. So um, I think, you, you know, it was mentioned, if you're looking at how headcount is turning over in a specific area, is that tied to some type of DEI metric that isn't getting measured today? And then you can add that into the process. But once you have your roadmap, I, I, I believe that then you can really set what data is getting measured and then go from there and make an automation of 
how many times during a, a calendar year will you continue to measure the business, retest, and then you can you know pivot the strategy from there. And it's you know from I think reaching company goals, it's over communicating why you're testing, why these specific metrics, and really getting buy-in from the business. Great, thanks, Alton. Uh, Brian. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think this starts at the top of the funnel. Uh, I, I think you have to really focus there. In technology, we, we also, some of our analytics also show us our applicant pool, like diversity in our applicant pool. And we've sort of seen like, I mean, if you're just relying on sort of reactive posting and technology, you know what you're going to get. I mean, you're not going to have the diversity there. So it sort of starts at, I think you have to be outside of the automation piece, I mean, you have to be intentional. We've actually made um, DE&I one of our core values. And why that's important though, is because our core values, we as I think the second step to that is there has to be accountability. We, our performance, every performance review, our employees are measured on how they're performing against our core values. And that's the key point. I don't think, I think it's one thing to say on your website that you, that you're about DEI. It's another thing to hold people accountable in your business for achieving against it. And that's a critical point. I think something that we did to achieve that. So I think the intent has to be there. That's how we created. Um, I think that, uh, you know, help with the, the buy-in, the education, right? All of those pieces that need to go into it. But in terms of the automation, um, I think there we have a two-pronged approach. Yes, we, we do some auto posting. We have auto posts that go out, but then we also use, like I would say, use a sourcing tool for us where you can get passive candidates. For us, it's LinkedIn. We have a built-in integration with LinkedIn. We have LinkedIn recruiter seats. That is where we more intentionally go out and supplement and build a diverse talent community. And by having built out these diverse talent communities at the top of the funnel, our diversity, it has imp impacted our diversity in the rest of the company. And so getting into the specific specifics of that, I think it's you're building searches that you can save that are keying in on things like, I mean, it might be a variety of things for different companies out there, but languages, um, you might be keying in on um, Nesby groups or membership, um, uh, HBCUs, right? You can build into your searches hitting all these HBC. So you can build in a lot of automation into those searches to pull, to balance um, that talent community. So it's balanced at the top. I mean, the results for us, uh, you know, if I break it down to the results, I mean, we're, our company now, th this is the biggest thing we've done, by the way, there's not, I, I, I don't think there's a source. I don't think there's one place you go to, like a lot of people are like, I've come here for diversity and you go and you just sometimes don't see the results. I think you, you have to have the intent you, and some of that is manual. I mean, there's you know, some of that you do have to go in and do the work and dig through profiles and not just mass communicate, but look through the profiles to sort of gauge out and suss out and find um, th that diversity in thought and diverse backgrounds, et cetera. By making that that one, that's the biggest change I think we've made. We are 50 percent women in our company, 50 percent women in leadership, and we're now 30 percent racially and ethnically diverse in a tech company. I mean, I've not I've never worked. I've worked in technology for 25 years. And I've never seen that. So that's kind of the biggest improvement. That's the best thing I could say is those integrations we have with say a, a tool like a platform like LinkedIn uh, and then being able to build in some of that automation into your actual searches to, to start to supplement um, the, your talent communities to be more diverse. Thanks. Um, Tisha is gonna share uh, her answers in the chat. So uh, folks on the call, you can go ahead and uh, read it over there. Awesome. Uh, Jeremy. So I don't know if there's a ton of value I can add on top of those two amazing answers um, that we just heard. Uh, I was actually taking some notes on areas where we can improve with, with our strategy, uh, listening to the two experts. But I would say to, to start, even before you can have that strategy, is really um, finding the areas of underutilization you know, by looking at the data. So that means you have to take a really honest look in the mirror at your organization to find the areas where, where you need to identify where you can get better. And that can be a hard first step. There is a level of vulnerability that comes along with saying, hey, we are really poor here, right? Why is that? Is it a hiring manager? Is it a, a division? Is it a group? And, and how are we going to get better? So I think before you can start sourcing or having some of those intentional efforts and then automating um, you're sourcing employer branding campaigns and the different things that help with the top of the funnel analytics around diversity. You know, you have to understand and, and be very strategic around what, what are you trying to drive and, and how is that going to work? Um, but then once you are able to kick off those campaigns and maybe create some of the automation, 
understanding diversity at the top of the funnel and pass through rates for stage, then you can look at the data and, and get better in those areas. But I think those first two answers really hit the, the nail on the head for sure. Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay. Um, so improving com communication is oftentimes the first step in improving efficiency. Can you share with us some ideas for shortening feedback loops between recruiting, hiring managers, and cross-functional stakeholders? Allison, why don't we go ahead and get started with you? Yeah, so it, I, I, I hesitate to answer this because I, I believe it depends on the culture of your business on how the business communicates. And so some businesses are more email focused, some are more Slack focused. So I do think that there's an opportunity for HR just as an overall function to really come in and, and lay the groundwork for how the business communicates about HR matters and, and, and where, you know, they, they point people. I found it best to get as much information as I can into the ATS that I'm utilizing. And a lot that I've used have direct links that are just copy and paste. I can throw them into an email when I'm sending that scorecard out um, or when I'm scheduling, put it in a calendar invite. There are API plugins where you can make that seamless as well. So I think wherever you decide you want that feedback to live, oftentimes in an inbox isn't the best place and a Slack channel also can be great if it's full visibility, but and it's searchable, right? But again, not you know not the not the best place. So where where will it um, where will you have the ability to pull the data that you need for the next time that candidate might go through a process is a question that I often answer myself. And where where will that be at your fingertips? And so it's 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 answering that question first, and then making it the easiest path possible for the person submitting the feedback to do that. Because we all know that if it doesn't happen really within that first hour or two, you may not get it. And then you're, I'd like to say, hurting cats at that point, or you're, you're chasing people down. And so that's where I see the inefficiency happening, not to mention all the lost intel that you're getting on the candidate. So wherever you're having the data live, I would say, shortening um, the make it a path of least resistance for the person putting it in and then sharing it, you know, collectively. I found just live calls, status calls are the best way to do that, whether, you know, you're an HR team. I know if you have recs that go up into the, you know, kind of the double digits, it's very hard to do um, with every search, but at least for that first, I think, launch period, to stay aligned and to stay calibrated is really necessary. Great, Brian. Yeah, de I definitely agree with uh, many of those points. I mean, it's, it sometimes does vary by organization. I'll try to list these out, you know, pretty quickly here. But I would say, I, I say when it comes to sort of your your ATS and your system, don't compromise on a system that doesn't capture all communications. I mean, when we're talking about communications, we're also talking about speed of communications, right? I think the the efficiencies there. So if it's if you have to go outside of the system to then go dig out all of this from this pertinent, really critical information. And your sister's not, your system is at least not capturing the critical stuff. Yes, we have communications that happen in Slack and things like that, but I think the core things need to be captured in the, in the platform. Tagging, like the, the ability to tag managers inside your platform, see the responses inside the platform. If anybody else on my team needs to get in and see what's happening, if I'm out or a manager needs to see, they can see everything that's happening. They have access to that too. Um, I think one of the, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. I think one of the biggest bottlenecks is decision on after an interview, right? So the fact that this functionality we have with this, you know, automation of scorecards that going on to the right onto the manager's calendar, when they fill out the scorecard, that also automatically all uploads into our system. Everybody can see it. I can see in real time where we're at with decisions and then I can push where I need to push. And if I need to go to somebody's manager, I'm going to go to somebody's manager, right? But we can push the buttons we need to to make things happen quickly by having all that stuff in one location. I don't have to dig through emails. Oh, did it, was that sent to my manager or your manager? Who emailed that where? What's the decision? There's none of that, right? So we cut that out. Um, so we mentioned about the the uh, that. I think we, you know, looking further too, I mean, obviously, if you don't have auto automated approval chains on your offer letters and automated templates on your offer letters, like 
get there. That, I mean, you know, I, mean, I, I think most people here probably are doing that, but definitely you need that. And then a big thing I would highlight, one of the last things I would highlight is, to, is definitely like onboarding, paperless onboarding. If you can integrate all of your things into an, an automated onboarding, onboarding tool, which is something also that we have that has video uh, integrated, like video message from your, um, you know, from the CEO, um, you know, the ability for the candidates to write up uh, an intro about themselves that'll automatically fire off on day one that goes out to the entire company also goes into Slack. All of the paperwork is completed before day one. So people can train on day one. And that has been linked. There's a lot of, you can go out there and find the statistics. I don't have them in front of you. There's pretty dramatic statistics about how people are onboarded and how that correlates to how long they stay with the company or if they stay past a year. Right. So, and a big part of that is being able to have them train and move into their job on day one, not spend their first two weeks or a month filling out all of their paperwork. Right. So I think that's critical. That's critical. The last thing I would say is I fight for less interviewers and minimal interview times. Like everybody wants to get in and, Oh, you know, an, an hour, 30 minutes is not long enough for me to do an interview. And, Oh, we need 12 people on the interview schedule. You don't. But the way that you get leverage on that is the data, right? You have to be able to still show that you're hitting your quality of hire, which is the quality is, which is why that's so important is to continually track that. Cause you can say, look, we did that. We tried that with this team and we didn't lose quality. Let's try that with your team. But I say, you got to keep fighting for that because it's just going to managers will run your process for you and you will keep losing hires over it because they keep arguing, Oh, 30 minutes is not, a, we do 30 minutes. We do 30 minute interviews typically not on some of our software roles. It's longer. So there's a, it, it does sometimes vary by role, but our typical standard is 30 minutes. Our team interview is four interviews, 30 minutes each. And so if you can fight for that and still maintain quality of hire, I think you're doing things really well. So. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Tisha, we're looking forward to your answer uh, in the chat in terms of uh, tips on shortening feedback loops. Okay, great. Um, Jeremy, why don't we get your thoughts as well? Yeah, I feel like Brian has a cheat code because he works at an organization where literally these are the tools that are all integrated together and he can say, hey, this doesn't work right. And then they just build the workflow. So I feel like he's cheating. <laughs> Uh, and it has an advantage over the rest of us that have to piece together systems at times, but um, the same type of things, right? Automated scorecard reminders, uh, implementing hard SLAs on, on gathering that feedback in a timely manner. We are a huge fan at Codility of proper debriefs discussing candidates that have moved through to a certain stage. And yes, it does take time to get everybody live, but you can accomplish so much in a quick 15 to 20 minute meeting walking through um, one thing we've done really well as we built out and revamped all of our processes is training our hiring managers around how we're measuring certain competencies so we can pull in different interviewers from different groups for speed purposes. Uh, but what it does is it breeds consistency in our process because now we're all speaking the same language. We all know how Brian is assessing adaptability is the same way that Jeremy is right, so that we can pull in different interviewers and, and try to automate parts of those processes. Um, and I keep hate to, to keep harping on, on the data point, but uh, that's another area where you can easily automate is, is understanding pipeline in, uh, analytics, uh, identifying those inefficiencies in the processes that, that hold you up, um, creating automation using different templates and in the integrations in your, your ATSs in every single area that you can. Uh, when we get to the offer stage, automating your offer templates. At Codility, we have entities in four countries and they all do things differently. So building those in, having those um, uh, tokenized templates built into the system so that it removes um, human error as you go through. Uh, but then we sync our greenhouse approvals uh, with DocuSign and we have additional templates built out in DocuSign. So what used to take us two days to generate an offer for our German entity, now we can literally do in two clicks. So I would say, look at all the different functionality, find the areas where it can help you because every little bit does, does count. Great, thank you. Uh, so reducing candidate drop-off is really crucial. Uh, your recruiting team spends so much time and energy uh, getting great candidates in the funnel and all the way to the hire stage. How do you keep candidates engaged between those steps in the hiring journey? Uh, Tisha, we would love, why don't we start with you? We'll put, you can put your answer uh, in the chat for folks to read through. Um, and then in the meantime, 
uh, Jeremy, we can, we'd love to yeah. hear you there. Yeah, the, the first thing is, is clearly articulating the process up front. Having that honest uh, communication from the beginning lets the candidates know exactly what they, they can expect. Um, reinforcing with the candidate that they're interviewing you as much as, as you know, you're interviewing them, I think also plays a crucial part in getting their buy-in to, to see how interested they're in. We actually have a, a pick your own interview path at Codility that gets the candidates engaged in the process and it shows how much we value their time. So if there's someone within our organization that they think is a beneficial conversation for them as part of their interview process, we really facilitate them. Um, and I think the data shows about 40% or so of candidates now are taking us up on that offer. And almost all of those candidates we've seen are making it to those final steps in the process, if not receiving an offer. So that's been really, really positive for us. Um, we also use Comparably, which is another very, very interesting employer branding tool for some of our EB strategy. They have some really cool templates to where you can create content uh, for your candidates as they get deeper in the process. Um, specific to the teams they're interviewing for. And the cool thing about Comparably, it's literally feedback from people that work in your organization now. So you can create these different documents that send out that talk about, hey, we rank in the top 10 of engineering happiness and top 10 in pay and top 15% in, in culture and what that might be. And you can send out a lot of that content uh, at different steps in the process to keep them engaged. And we're also starting to toy around with the idea of creating different video messages at certain points in the process. So maybe a message from our chief people officer who's super engaging and uh, adds so much to our culture, or even our CEO that plays a big part as a, a smaller company going through a large growth phase around what is that vision and, and just really thanking them for their time, for being a part of the process and, and seeing it through to the end. So I think the more personal that we can keep it, the better we can articulate what they can expect um, makes us keep our candidates in our process better. Thanks, Jeremy. Allison? I think for me, it's in where I've seen, whether on the search side as a search partner or um, at STG, I've seen really understanding why the candidate is engaged in the process initially and knowing what is motivating to them about the opportunity. And then from there, really understanding that during the first conversation, um, understanding their timing too. And to Jeremy's point, aligning that to the process and then staying really flexible and, and being able to move really quickly and making sure your hiring teams have all of that detail around the scorecard, around what is the role. So the role description and really making sure that they can have a decision unified quickly uh, we're seeing right now at the executive level, folks have three offers in hand still uh, when they're entering a process and candidates are able to make decisions quickly. They're coming into a search process really aligned, knowing what they want. And so we can close a candidate within a two week cycle as long as all of those things are in place. Um, and it, so I would say once you have a candidate engaged, continuing the momentum with them um, and, and, and pivoting to if they're a lead candidate, maybe a bit around their timeline as well. Um, you know, some other things that we've seen or that I've seen between the steps to, to, to make sure that candidates are engaged are, um, you know, just really listening about points in their candidate process. So knowing I'll use for an example, it, it's, it's kind of outside of the realms of probably what any of us have the budget to do, but there was an executive uh, at Zoom that was interviewing and what really put them, um, like they were, they were hesitant to leave Zoom. They were a long tenured executive. And the reason why they left was because the CEO of the company that was recruiting them hopped on an airplane to meet them in person. And it's just ironic because they were, you know, a Zoom executive. And it's it's those things, I think, depending upon, you know, what level and how much time you can invest per candidate. Once you get to those final stages, there are personal things and personal levers to do um, as well.
Thanks, Allison. Awesome. Uh, Brian? Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I second, but there's a lot of great points in those, uh, both of those answers too, about definitely with engagement. Uh, I think something that, that Jeremy st- said really stood out, pick your, this pick your own interview path sounds amazing, right? This, this sort of engagement you're having with a, a candidate. So, I mean, a lot of this, what we're talking about is employee or candidate engagement, right? Um, and candidate experience. And so I think the biggest point I can make here, try to boil it down is like, what we try to do here is be the candidate's guide, not the gatekeeper. I think so many people have don't really realize that a lot of recruiters set themselves up to be like, you know, the one that you have to get through to get access to the rest of the, uh, you know, the company. And sometimes I've seen recruiters have even an ego about that, right? They sort of feel like, hey, that's where I'm important. You have to get through me. And it's just the wrong approach. I think if you sort of feel like you're standing side by side with somebody during the process, not in front of them, you can accomplish so many more things because they always feel like you are on their side. I want you to get the job. That's the way I approach every candidate. I want you to, I want this to be the greatest experience for you. And if it wasn't, I have more leeway there to tell you why it wasn't. So things like in the experience of like get it, giving more information that you maybe were traditionally afraid to give, there's a partnership there that you've built with that person where you, a lot of times you can start to give that. And so to give, just a couple of uh, kind of quick examples, something we do that's very different. We've done, we've tried with one of our roles. We actually will tell, this is more of an entry level role, but we will tell candidates in our, that are interviewing for some of our, it's called an account development rep. It's essentially a business development role. We'll tell them what they're doing wrong in the interview. Like if I like them, if our, if, if, if our team likes them where we think there's potential, I want to move them forward, but I know that they might crash and burn on the next uh, the next round because of the way that they're approaching, I will actually give them that feedback. I will say, here's how to improve. And they're like, nobody's ever told me that before. I've had people tell me like, this is the greatest interview experience they've ever had because you're giving them access to information they've never had. And this is also separating you, which is the, it's just a part of our role, right? If you look at employer, employer branding, I mean, it's, you have to separate yourself from everybody else, not be the same. So you have to take some risks and do some things that nobody else is doing. And so this is this is one of those approaches and one of those things that you can you can do to do that. And so um, our managers know we're doing it. Uh, so we're not just sort of like, hey, like giving the test answers away so we can make a hire. The point, though, is, is in a in a high growth SaaS company, adaptability and, and ability to do it quickly and take direction and do something with it is a is is a competency. And so we're actually evaluating further that candidate's ability to take that direction and do something with it. And what we found is the candidates can do it well and the ones that, that can't well. And so it still weeds out, it gets us to where we need to be in terms of making quicker decisions, but it's a very different approach compared to what a lot of companies take. Another thing I'll say real quick is a lot of employers, be careful not to promote who you want to be instead of who you are, right? So many people are like, they, they don't realize like they're, they're actually selling a falsity about their company. They're actually out here saying, what they, what they think their company is, but it's not actually who they are today. And so that comes down to branding. Without getting into a whole conversation about branding, we do have on our blog out on our careers page, we have a whole write-up of how to, on no budget, essentially create your own employer brand, build this, because this ends up going into all your messaging. Now you're you're putting out to the into the, the candidate world all your EVP all the time, all the things that separate your employer value proposition, right? Instead of for example, the bottom of your job description, like the about us blurb that nobody ever reads. What if you put your DEI initiatives and numbers and your results down there? What if you put, you know, some of your core benefits if you have every other Friday off, right? Things that are going to go and in your messaging, messaging is key. You can go to all of these sites to get candidates, but it's really the messaging that's going to grab them. So you don't need to go as many if you have good messaging and it starts there. So I think those are probably the areas that um, I think you know, you really want to focus in. I'm, I'm looking at a couple of my notes that I jotted down just to make sure I'm not losing anything. But I, um, I, I think I would just wrap up like um, uh, somebody mentioned in the chat about video interviews. We found at one point, it, still analyze your process and make sure it's not working against you. We were doing interview, um, we were outreaching to candidates. And then when we would set up the initial call, they would find out that it was a, a video interview. Well, they weren't ready to invest that time be ready on a a video call we actually lost 50 percent of the people that already were interested in talking to us as soon as they found out that interview was going to be video so we moved it to the next round we moved the video to the hiring manager and got all of those people back and then video if you're doing a one a video capture interview inside your platform of like as part of your application process i would make sure it's optional 
I, I mean, that's what we, I don't see the, but you're going to lose some really good candidates that are maybe on the fly that are in between doing something else that could apply that are like, well, I'm not in a situation yet where I can do video. You can go to the ones that did video first and evaluate them. And yes, are they going to have a better, potentially a better opportunity to get looked at? Yes. But, uh, but I wouldn't say to make it a requirement because they're, in this market, you're going to lose a lot of potentially really good candidates that just want to apply quicker. So sorry, a lot of information, but I'll, I'll end there, but those, that's my input. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Brian. Yeah. All right, we've got one question left before we open it up to Q&A. So we're going to go, we're going to try speed answer for the last one. Um, can you share with us some of the challenges you see with screening, uh, delaying candidate start dates and how you get around this bottleneck? Um, so what are, what are, what's one best practice for preventing uh, screening and other paperwork? Uh, from delaying candidate start dates. Um, for example, at Checker, we understand the, important, the importance of having mobile first technology um, because that can improve you know, the candidate experience and also lead to faster screening. Um, Allison, I'm gonna kick it off to you. Yeah, so, and, and Tisha put in the chat as well that she just keeps it simple. I echo that um, explicitly. And to Brian's point, I'll, I'll keep this fast and I think that this helps with screening. Um, so he was talking about just giving real time feedback to candidates. I would echo that um, to the interviewers as well. You know, just staying really tight in that feedback loop, making sure you're you're getting that feedback um, and, and you're holding them accountable. So we have to, at, at STG, report to our, our partnership group, so LPs, GPs, all of our talent data. So our, our numbers. Um, so we have to measure that and, and we're collecting it. Uh, if you're an HR leader, I know we have a lot of people with teams under 10. Um, I would start there and, and just really know how long is, is each candidate going at each stage again. And then, you know, ensuring as you're giving feedback, to, you know, to Brian's point that you're tracking why candidates aren't moving through the process. So you can, you know, tweak your search practice or your search process if needed. Okay, great. We've got a few minutes left. So in the, in the interest of time, um, I wanna say thank you again for sharing all of that insight and experience with us. Um, for folks on the call, please submit your questions uh, through the Q&A panel if you haven't already, and we're gonna move on to our next segment. Um, so. If you want to take a look at the poll section, um, if you'd like more information um, from today's partner, um, please go ahead and go to the poll section and answer that. All right. So let's see. All right. We're going to move on to your questions. Um, and also to note that we're, we'll drop the SHRM uh, credit code into the chat. So make sure to screenshot that or write it down. Uh, but in the meantime, let's see what's coming in from our live audience. All right. How do you make sure, from Catherine, how do you make sure hiring managers are as invested in DE&I goals around the hiring process as recruiters are so that it's a full team effort? Anyone want to take this one? I think it really starts at the top. You have to have executive buy-in around your DEI strategy. It has to be part of your core values. It has to be something that uh, is trained through the organization. And if you don't have that type of support, you can drive really hard on the talent side, but managers are not going to pick up those pieces. But if they're held accountable by the senior level leaders, and this is something that's valued through the organization, I think it has to start there. Yeah, we, we developed the DEI task force as well. That task force is actually what pushed uh, our leaders and surface that what they thought was a priority of, of making DEI a core value and therefore uh, being measurable, right, in terms of uh, each employee's performance, which I already talked about, which I agree with Jeremy completely. That's the, that's the critical piece, in my opinion. Great. Um, everyone, thank you for all of your questions. We're going to wrap up um, as we hit. Uh, the end of the hour. And as a reminder, uh, if you're looking to receive SHRM credit today, be sure to grab that code from the chat. It's right in there right now. Um, this recording will be sent out to you in the next few days. Um, and again, thank you to everyone who attended. Um, a big shout out to our group of speakers and partners for their help in making the discussion today possible. Um, and wherever you are, we hope you have a really great day. Um, and again, thank you for joining. All right. Bye.